Red Letters, we are continuing. And today we are exploring Matthew chapter 13, verse 53 to 58, in tandem with Mark 6, verses 1 to 6a. These two sections of scripture fused together creates a full picture. And today, Jesus visits his home. He returns to a place called Nazareth. Now, growing up, I lived in Midland, Ontario. Mom, you can confirm all of this. It looks a little bit different, but when we moved to Midland, this was our first home on 4th Street, 306 4th Street. It was a little bungalow, not a lot of heat, but a lot of fun. This is where I spent my formative years, at least those earliest ones. And you know, when, when I can, I enjoy returning to Midland. And I enjoy driving by the homes I used to live in, rekindling memories of places I played, the moments I enjoyed. So this is where it began on 306 4th Street. There's a few stories to tell from that house. Well, for some reason we decided to move, and we moved to the other side of town, Queen Street. Queen and Young, it was that corner street. Remember the Schmidts lived above us, Mom? How many of you have seen the news recently where there was a young lady that threw pumpkin seeds at the Prime Minister? You remember that story on the news lately? That girl lived upstairs. <laughs> they became friends of our family. No, we are not pumpkin seed throwers, but we were friends with that family. That was, we just lived there for a short period of time, and then we migrated to the other side of town again, to 550 King Street, apartment 309. So yes, the apartment is up in that corner there. We, we lived there, and even my bedroom window was in that picture, I believe. So anyway, we lived there for a few years, and then we got tired of apartment life, and we decided to move into a home again. So we moved, this is all in the same town. It just, it, it starts to add up. So yeah, we moved to Allen Street. It was only for three weeks. <laughs> there was problems with the, the boundary or whatever, but I still remember I read the book of Jaws in there and ate German chocolate. Mm. Things you remember, it's crazy. <laughs> and so then we moved to our house, which I think was our favorite of probably all of them. This was 490 Midland Avenue. Yes, I spent a lot of years there. You notice the cobblestone house? You know the cobblestones up to the roof? Can you see the, the windows there? That was my bedroom. As I entered my teen years, guess where I could get in and out? <laughs> Do the deductions. Mom never knew until a few years ago. She says, you did. I go, whatever, Mom. <laughs> Next slide. Oh, yes, we went back to the apartment. <laughs> I don't know why, but we lived on the first floor, which is also in that. So that was apartment 101. Yes, I remember all of this. And we were there for just a year and a half, two years. And we got bored of that, we moved to another house. But two blocks away, this was on Wellington Street. We lived upstairs, her grandmother lived downstairs. Remember that, Mother? Yes. Oh, yes, memories. And then we, we moved to another house. <laughs> yeah, this was Russell Street. My other grandmother lived there. And I had a basement downstairs, and yes. And then I moved to another house. <laughs> this was on Quebec Street, and it was so steep, you couldn't even bring the car. We had a standard. You couldn't even bring the car to a park. We just rolled by, and I jumped out. That's how we did it. Anyway, that was Midland. Midland was the place I called home. Well, that was just a little, little peek into my life, because I know you were so fascinated. Um, growing up, Jesus lived in Nazareth. Now, this little community was built into a crater-like geological formation, kind of like a shallow swale. Now, there are various ideas as to the origin of the name Nazareth. One includes the derivation of a word, Netzer, which literally means a little speck or germ. And truly, it would be likened, uh, for the people that lived, live in Chatham, to the southeast side of Chatham. It was the poorer part of the neighborhoods. And people of that day would see things like, you know, nothing good can come from Nazareth. And you'll read that in the Bible. It was a place Joseph and Mary lived, maybe due to the circumstances of pre-wedded pregnancy, and thus Nazareth became home for the boy named Jesus. According to Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, it was prophesied that Jesus would live his life, be born and, and grow up, 
in Nazareth, and to the very end of his earthly life and beyond, he would always be known as the Nazarene, or Jesus of Nazareth. Now, in recent weeks, um, with last week being the exception, the words of Jesus have prompted us to look at different subjects, that of moments of doubt, um, activating faith, all the biblical teaching on judgment. So we're left to wonder, what's next? What's next in the life and the words of Jesus? We find that Jesus leaves Jerusalem, he makes his journey to Nazareth. And I have to admit to you, this was a very strange thing for him to do. I like going home to Midland to rekindle memories, to replay, you know, the, play, the things that happened in the places I live. But it's a very strange thing here that Jesus went to Nazareth because he had already returned there once before. And it didn't end so well. They actually tried to kill him. But he returns. We read about it here from the passages I quoted. And I'm reading it from a version that takes um, the text and fuses them together, the life of Christ in stereo. Jane, have you been reading along with me? I had a girl, she has a copy. And it says, And Jesus withdrew from there and came to his boyhood town. And his disciples were following him. And with the coming of the Sabbath, he began to teach them in their synagogue. And many on hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did he get all these things? And what is the wisdom that is given him, that such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of the carpenter? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Jude? And his sisters, are they not all here with us too? And to them he was a cause of stumbling. And Jesus said to them, You know, a prophet is not without honor, but in his hometown, and among his kinfolk, and in his home. And Jesus could not perform there any mighty works because of their unbelief, except that he had laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. So he marveled over and over at their unbelief. Now I told you already that this passage baffled me. It really baffled me. I had to meditate and reflect on it for a long time, and ask God, what why would Jesus return to Nazareth? It does not make sense. The last time he was there, and we, read, we can read about it in Luke chapter 4, and we've already covered this ground in the Love Red Red series. An official of the synagogue had asked him to read scripture. He read from Isaiah, a messianic prophecy saying something like, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And they understood when he said, Today it is fulfilled that he was referring to himself as the Messiah. And they chased him out of town with the intent to kill him. It says he went right to the edge of town, and then he disappeared. So what on earth was Jesus thinking returning to Nazareth? What would motivate him to return to his hometown? Why would Jesus return to his home? So I wrestled with this. And the answer that emerges, I think, unlocks one of the preeminent meanings of this incident. I have to get a little bit personal with you this morning and tell you something that I was experiencing for many, many years in my uh, adult life. My mom, will re well, she grew up in Toronto at <coughs> Bayview Avenue, right? 17, 16 Baby Avenue. Now, I told you I've moved in a lot of places. This is how I sort out my life. I remember all the addresses and all the phone numbers. They're there. This is how I structure my life to make sense of it. My mom grew up at 1716 Bayview Avenue, and even while I was spending my formative years in Midland with my mom, on certain occasions like Christmas and summer months, I would go and visit my grandmother and my grandfather when he was there at this home. For me, it was a really happy place. Uh, there was never any sadness there, at least for me as a boy. I had the opportunity to be a child, to dream, to play, and to enjoy the company of grandparents. Of course, your grandparents get older, things change. You no longer get to go back to that house, they've moved, and of course, they've passed on. I began to have a dream at night, and it turned out to be a recurring dream with a variation. 
I must have dreamt it 15, 20 times, but each dream being a little different. In the dream, I would go to 1716 Bayview Avenue. I would walk up the narrow driveway between the two houses. I would see the, the little box beside the door where you would put the milk or the newspapers. Remember that, folks? Mm -hmm. I would go in the side door, turn a little bit to my left, and go up the stairs into the kitchen. And of course, in my dream, Grandma and Grandpa weren't there. I knew they weren't there. But I was able to explore the house again and find comfort in exploring the familiar and happy place that I enjoyed so much as a child. On one occasion, I would go through the kitchen, I'd open the drawers, or I'd see the little things above the sink that my grandmother collected. I would see the, the radio on top of the shelf behind the, the kitchen table and, and the door to the porch, and Mom's all seeing this as I explain it to her. But that would be only one dream, and then I would go out, the same door I came in, and a voice would say to me quietly, it's okay, Douglas, you can always go back. It was a beautiful dream, and it always comforted me. The next time I would, I would be able to explore the living room, and I would, like a little boy, be crawling on, on my hands and knees, playing my cards behind the couch and along the fireplace. And the next time I would be able to go into the basement and open the, all the toolboxes and the boxes of my grandpa. And every time I would be able to leave out the side door, and the voice would say to me, It's okay, Douglas. You can always go back again. What a beautiful dream. One Sunday, oh, about 20 years ago, I was on the platform in a church wall and a colleague of mine was leading worship and singing a song, We have come into this house and gathered in his name to worship him. And as he led that song, I had a moment that nobody else could see. But there was huge conversation and revelation happening within my heart and my mind. It just occurred to me there that I had had this recurring dream and I had had it just the night before. And I went into a house and I went into my grandma's house again. And this time I went in through the side door like I always did. But it was different. There was a lady standing there and she was a realtor. And I said, who are you? And I don't remember her name. But I remember looking around and the whole house had been remodeled. And I was devastated. I was devastated. I, I was lost. And I went into the dining room through the kitchen door and I turned around and I saw there was the French door but above the French door I saw in my dream a stained glass window. And I fell to my knees, and I went, oh, I remember that. And tears were coming out of my eyes. Everything else was different. I said, I remember that. But my grandmother was suddenly present with her hand on my shoulder and said, Douglas, things aren't the way you remember them. There was never a stained glass window there. Mm -hmm. I went out the front door this time, and the voice said, You'll never be back. Now that sounds like a sad ending. Except that God was showing me that my perceptions as a child to the way things were that brought me comfort were based on reality. My mom will tell you that while I was enjoying my childhood, our family had all sorts of issues. Sometimes children perceive things a certain way, but they're not based on reality. I was finding comfort where there truly wasn't any comfort. It was based on imagination. What God was bringing me to is to teach me that I had to find my comfort in Him and Him alone. And I couldn't revisit places in my memory as an alternative or something to replace Him. I needed to find my comfort in God. Why did Jesus return to Nazareth? Remember that Jesus was not only fully God, but he was fully man. And as such, the Bible says he was tempted in every way like we are. And just like you, it occurs to me that Jesus would look for comfort as well. Was he trying to find approval amongst the familiar names and faces he grew up with? I mean, why else would he return? They had previously tried to kill him. 
He had already learned in his previous visit, firsthand, that a prophet is not accepted or honored in his hometown, but now it's happening all over again. We're told in Scripture that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, and like each of us, he must learn life lessons to find his comfort in the Father and the Father alone. I was thinking of King David, young King David, who met a young man, the king's son, Jonathan, and they were close friends. And every time John, or David had a need, he turned to Jonathan until Jonathan was no longer there. And David had to learn that it wasn't another person he needed to turn to, but he needed to find his comfort in God alone. And David would write, Lord, ha ha you have helped me and comforted me. May your unfailing love be my comfort according to the promise of your servant. And so here is the big question this morning. Where do you find your comfort? Do you look to family for your comfort? Do you eat comfort food? Your trouble? What about shopping? You feeling down and out? You go shopping to soothe your soul. Is that where you find comfort? Saving money? Sleeping? A lot of people find comfort in familiar Christmas traditions and they try to recapture them again and again each year. But when will we learn to turn to God? And this is so timely for, for Advent. When will we learn to let His words wash over us and let His rod and His staff comfort us? Because the journey of the Christian life is to learn that God alone is enough. As we grow older, my mom and I, we deal with this, we learn that Christmas traditions will change. We remember those wonderful times in, in, in the Toronto house where it was wall-to-wall -wall people around a big long table. We even had people from the neighborhood come and eat with us, and it was, it was wonderful. They were great times, but these are things that we cannot trust going forward. Our parents die. Children grow older. The places change. And so we need to shake off the need, the need to find comfort in those traditions and repeating the memories and find comfort in the Lord who is named Emmanuel because God is with us. And when you're at that moment of death, where will you find your comfort then? You can't go shopping. You can't eat a chocolate bar. You can't take all your favorite trinkets with you. <coughs> we need to let the Lord fill our empty hearts. Paul said, praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. And there's another takeaway here from Jesus' visit to Nazareth that will help us put some things in perspective. This is really helpful to me. You see, the, the people of Nazareth were at least on one level truly impressed with Jesus. They were amazed that the son of a carpenter who becomes a carpenter himself could be so knowledgeable and would emerge as a rabbi. Like, how did this happen? They were pleased that he had sex success out and about. You know, small town boy does good. But to see him anything else other than Carpenter, or, or for them, Mary's son. He's just one of the brothers. I mean, look, his sisters are with us. I mean, they all grew up playing in the dirt. For them, the humanity of Jesus and their memories of him were, were an impenetrable barrier. It was inconceivable that Jesus was anything else other than talented. They were blinded. Seeing God as the source of Jesus' abilities. So on a lesser level, you all know me as pastor. People in the community call me reverend. My family knows I'm a pastor, I'm a reverend. But that doesn't register to them. To them, I am Dougie. That's who I am, I'm Dougie. I still hear stories. Oh, when you were little, you used to go around telling everybody you were a race car driver. I mean, you're Dougie. That's all you are. And for this reason, I know that my influence on my own family will always be limited. You see, Jesus marveled at the Nazarites and their unbelief. Their memories of him were 
or causes for stumbling. And we all want to be able to influence our members of our family. But we have to be realistic in this regard. In terms of family, they just see you one way. It's hard for them to see you any other way. So pray for your parents, pray for your siblings, pray for those who you grew up with, but be kind to yourself with your expectations. Live the life, the Christian life, by finding your comfort in God, but don't be surprised when it's someone else other than you that gets their attention and turns their heart towards the Lord. Because invariably that's what's going to happen. Let me close with this. How many of you are Blue Jay fans? Let's go Blue Jay. <laughs> Two? Three? Come on! If you, if you guys are Detroit fans, like go, leave right now. Like find another church. Like this, this cannot work. R.A. Dickey, a Blue Jay, right? Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> He's okay with that. In 2012, in the National League, he won the Cy Young Award, which is the, the highest honor for a pitcher. I mean, this is a special player. But his career almost ended before it even began. The Texas Rangers in 1996 made him their number one draft pick, and they offered him an entry-level contract of $810,000. All they had to do was pass a routine physical exam. Well, Dickey is a committed follower of Jesus. And as he entered training camp, he said a prayer. He uttered a prayer. Lord, thank you, Lord, for all your blessings and for helping me get this far. Just an outpouring of gratefulness. But unknown to him, the physical revealed that his right elbow, his pitching arm, was missing its ulnar collateral lig ligament. I don't know what that is, but I think it's important for pitching. <laughs> so shortly after his prayer... The general manager, who's named Doug Melvin, I'm friends with his brother actually, he lives in this area. Uh, the general manager called Dickie in and said, we're going to retract our offer. We think there's something wrong with your elbow and we have no interest in you anymore. So Dickie writes, I tried to take those words in for a second. We are going to retract our offer. And Dickie says, I don't feel devastation or anger, I feel rage. Complete and utter rage, like a tsunami. It, it, it comes up from in my toes and blasts upward through my body, into my guts and right through the top of my head. And I begin to say, Melvin, you do not. But he says it's as if there's a strong hand on his shoulder holding him back, causing him to pause. In that instant, he says, I have self-control that wasn't there moment earlier, and he says, I hear a voice. Relax, all right, I've got you. It's okay. The voice is the Holy Spirit. He says, I was just talking to God in prayer, and now he's talking back to me, giving me composure that could not have come from anywhere else. Here's a man on the brink of not, of losing it all, found his comfort in God. God had other plans for him. He became an incredible pitcher. He won the Cy Young Award and he played for the Blue Jays. A man who found his comfort in God. When will we learn to find our comfort? Not in anything else, but in God Himself. This is Advent. This is what we need to do. Heavenly Father, help us. To not be attached to so many people or so many things or so many experiences. Not that they're not important or for us to enjoy, but ultimately help us to find our comfort, our sustenance, our strength in you and you alone. May we be able to say that God alone is enough.